activated or something, then you're guaranteed with heirloom to get that same one again. Now what I have found is that not all heirloom seeds do as well in this area, so I would not do an entire garden only simply with heirloom seeds. Definitely would not, especially with broccoli. I grow a hybrid broccoli because the hybrid, um, they're not bad to grow. Hybrid just means that they have crossed different plants together. It, it's kind of like taking a German Shepherd and a Labrador and you get a Shepherdor, okay? That's more adapted and bred for a colder climate. You see what I mean? So that's what they do with plants. So what I have found with broccoli, especially in our area, is the hybrid broccoli does better than the heirloom. And I'm sure it's the same with different things. You just have to do your own trials, but if you're going to try heirloom, I would also do just regular non-heirloom seeds, and I would also try some of the hybrid seeds also. That way you're not disappointed. Um, so the next thing on the seed package to look at is how many days of maturity. So these are turnips, and they, sit, they say 50 days. So I could grow that here. That doesn't mean that as soon as you put the uh, seed into the soil that in 50 days you're going to be eating a turnip. That's not what that means. That means 50 days from emergence. That means 50 days from the time that it pops up out of the soil, you should have a turnip. Okay? So keep that in mind because this one actually, not all of them, but this package actually says days to emerge 5 to 10. So you have to add that on to the 50 days. Now if they're old seed, I've germinated 11-year-old seed before. It can take three or four weeks for it to pop up out of the soil. <laughs> so I, keep that in mind. I would at least allow two to three weeks on top of the 50 days. So that gives you an idea. So if you're trying to put turnips in the ground uh, right after frost in the first week of June, yeah, go back. Well, you can't put these in until after frost, so that doesn't matter. But anyway, just keep that in mind that you need to add the days to emergence to it. The seed packages will also tell you how deep to sow the seeds um, and how far they should be spaced apart from each other. Okay, so that's just kind of a little bit of help looking at seeds. And I know it's hard because, especially in December and January, you're looking at seed catalogs and you want this one and that one, and oh, why can't I grow this here, you know? But if it's for a warm climate, don't even try it. <laughs> You'll be disappointed. So when do you start seeds? When do you sow seeds? These are dates that I have come up with based on a zone five. And these are sown indoors on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, that's when I sow them outside. So inside, I will start my sweet potato slips. I'll get into that later. Herbs and flowers in January. Yes, I start early. In February, celery, eggplant, peppers, and tomatoes. In March, usually onions. And right now, I've already done cabbage and broccoli because I'm trying to get a head start. So that just kind of gives you an idea. And when I say sowing seeds, I'm talking about actually sowing them in a container like this in your home. All right. And then when you put stuff outside, well, greens, lettuces, spinaches, and peas can be put out as soon as you can start working your soil in your garden. So right now, obviously, you can't. At least most of us can't. We still have snow, right? But as soon as you can start working the soil, that means you can stick your uh, shovel in or you can till it and there's not so much water there that it's just a muddy mess, then wait, wait till it dries out some. And then after frost, these are your tender crops, okay? After frost, you can put your beans and your beets and your corn and potatoes in, after danger of frost. Another helpful tip is to make sure that you're keeping track because that obviously it differs year to year, but if you're trying to grow, say uh, you're trying to do uh, green peppers or something and you put them in your window to sprout them in February and they don't come up till March, well, keep track of that and say, these weren't good, these didn't come up till whenever, and then I wasn't eating them until August or whatever. So write everything down and then next year you'll remember, oh, I need to start these a month earlier because they didn't germinate for eight weeks or whatever. And I will tell you that eggplant takes forever to germinate and pop up and get going. So if you're going to do eggplant, start it in January. All right, so here's how you do it. I used to work in a greenhouse. I spent three summers working in a greenhouse, and um, I filled, <laughs> my days were filled with, filling these, these are called flats, with soil. And then we would haul these big flats up to the greenhouse, and then we'd get these little packs, um, and we would 
take the little tiny plants out of them, cell, cell packs they were called, and we would transplant them to these, okay? And then we would transplant them to bigger ones. And so this is how I learned some of these things, and we'll get into transplanting, but you need to make sure your soil is warmed up, okay? Don't bring in a frozen bag of soil from the garage and stick some seeds in it. Bring it in, warm it up for a week or two, make sure it's nice and warm. In fact, sometimes you could just get a bucket, put your potty mix in there and add hot water to it. Mix it around and get it wet first, okay? So it's nice and warm. Your seeds will germinate much, much better when it's warm. The soil is warm. And I also, recommend to always wet your soil down first before you put any seeds in it because that way when you poke your little hole in the dirt to put your seed in your seed will stay there okay <laughs> we'll just float all over the place with dry dirt in there all right so I have some pictures here I'll show you so the soil is wet there in the container I put the seeds in and then I'm covering it with a little bit of dirt and then gently 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 water it you don't want to you know because then your seeds will go everywhere um, so just gently, work, and then tap it in, okay? Just gently press it in like that. You're setting the seeds in place. And make sure that you label what you've put in that container or you will forget it. At least I do. And these are just some ideas. After you put your seeds in your soil, you can collect these little lettuce tubs like this and you can put them in there. And you've got yourself a little greenhouse. So. Um, what I do is I cover them, I close them up at night because the house usually gets cooler at night. And then during the day, you know, you can prop it up with a toothpick or something like that. Let some air in there, let it air out. Um, these, all just another size shape, but these work really well. And as you can see here, this is my fancy growing area. <laughs> this is my dresser in my bedroom. This is how I do it. Um, I do, don't use electricity to grow anything. I do not have grow lights and I do not have heating mats. We live off the grid and so I can't run all of that kind of thing, okay? There, therefore, I start January. So if you're starting now and if you have grow lights, your stuff should do just fine. If you don't have that kind of a thing, make sure you put it in a very, very sunny window. Um, and if you're, seed, if you're really trying to get your seeds to come up and give them a really a good boost, Put them on a heater. If you have a heater vent in your house, if you have a wood stove, you can put them on a rack above your wood stove. That works great. They will pop up in no time. If you have a refrigerator, put them on top of your refrigerator. That generates enough heat to help them to get them going now. Because it's actually kind of late right now. If you, I, I probably wouldn't even do a plant now. You may be able to do tomato and pepper now, okay? As long as you add some heat and get them up and get them going right now, okay? So, once your plants have popped up, like this, um, you need to think about transplanting them. And I hope you can tell they're in the center of, that's a pepper plant, but right in the center you'll see a little tiny set of leaves. Those are called the true leaves or the second set of leaves. Do you see the difference between the two little ones in the middle and then the two bigger leaves on the outside? And I know you can't see this from there, but this has a, one little tiny set of true leaves right in the middle. This, these are tomato plants. All my other tomatoes I've already transplanted, um, but I wanted to bring these to show you. Do not transplant anything until it has the second set of leaves on it or it will die. It has to have those. I don't understand the science behind it. I guess it's just enough growth to get it through the shock of transplant. Um, but wait until it has a good set of second leaves on it, and it may be a little bit taller, but that's okay. I will show you what to do with that, and then transplant it. Now, why do you want to transplant it? Why don't we just leave it in this pot until we put it in the garden? It won't be healthy, okay? It'll be very tall and very spindly. And people always ask me, why don't you just take a big pot like this, put some dirt in it, and put your seed in that? You can but it would grow and it would be extremely tall and spindly and fall over and unhealthy. Okay, we transplanted at the greenhouse three, four times before people even bought the plant. Because when you start little like this and then you put it in the next size up, I'll show you this, it forces the growth of the stem and it makes a really thick, healthy stem of a plant. Now, I'll, I'll show you how to do this. So this one has the second set of true leaves on it. So what I do is I just take a fork and I just dig it out. You're not going to hurt it, okay? Don't rip it out of there, obviously. 
really, but I just dig it out of the pot. See, you can see the leaves on, or the, the root. And then this is what it's going into next. These are called pony packs, by the way. You can find these. If you go to a greenhouse or a garden supplier at the end of the season, like now, this is the end of their transplanting season, they'll have these for sale and all of their flats too. Okay, so, and then I get my, I dig a little hole in there. And I wanna show you something else. Actually, I'm gonna set that down for a second. If you have, I'll show you this, tomatoes that look like this, because I went too long with them and I didn't transplant them and they're really long and spindly, you dig them out the same way and then what you do is you take that long tomato stem and you bend it like this. And you put it down inside the pot. And it doesn't hurt it, they're bendable. You don't want to crack it, obviously, but just gently bend it down like this. Or you can curl it around like a snake and put it in that way, okay? Because the goal is to bury it as deep as you can so that those last set of leaves are just barely above the soil. So I'm going to take this, you're not gonna really be able to see it, me doing it, but I'm just going to bend it in half like I showed you and push it down in that hole like that. And then cover it up and that's it. And that one actually could have gone down, but it's hard to do if you're like that. But, so that's how you will transplant it. Then, once these get tall, probably six, eight inches tall, and they start looking like they're about to fall over, well, you can add supports to it if you want a little bamboo stick. You can stick in there to hold it up for a while, but really they need to be transplanted too. So then you'll just pop them out of this container and put them in your next size up, which would be one of these sizes. And then you'll do the same thing again. Bend it down, put it down in there so just the top part of the plant is sticking up. And then once it gets it too tall for that one, when it looks like it's starting to fall over, then you put it in the next size. Now, if you have a greenhouse and it's warming up enough outside, you don't have to go to this size. Sometimes I don't. It just depends on the weather, really. You just never know. Sometimes my pot, my plants don't go past this size. Besides my dresser's not very big. <laughs> so I don't have room to put a hundred of these on there. <laughs> um, so anyway, just play it by ear and see. You know, if your plants are in this size and they're just really outgrowing their pot, you need to go bigger or you need to put them in the ground out in your greenhouse. So those are your options with that. And why do you want them to be so big like that before you put them outside? Has, has anybody just put, you know, small little tomato plants out in their garden and then come August you've got maybe some green tomatoes? And <laughs> okay, so when you do this method, you will be eating tomatoes in June and July and August and September and October. Because your plant is this big before you put it outside. In fact, before you put it outside, at this side, it should have flowers on it real soon. If you have a little teeny tiny tomato plant, you know, that's barely popped up above this thing, don't expect very much of it if you're just putting it in the ground in the middle of June. Mm -hmm. So this is why you start early, you transplant, and get those plants as large as you can before putting them outside. All right, so are there questions on the transplanting part before we go on to that? Because this is really, it's important. To do. Yes. Do you use cold flooring? What is it? Do you use a cold frame? A co do, no, I have a hoop house. And I will show you that too. And I will go over those too. She's asking about a cold frame. Okay, so now that you yes. On well, the broccoli. Um if it gets too spindly, what can you do about it? <laughs> um, you mean like when you're growing it in your house and mm -hmm. you're okay, it's uh, transplanted. Mm -hmm. So I've started broccoli in, in this, at home, not in this one, mm -hmm. and it's just about to start popping up. So it'll probably be about two inches tall before it gets its true leaves, and then I'll put it in the greenhouse. So I should wait till the true leaves. They're just yes. now coming yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then I'll put it in the garden yep, after right. that. Yeah. Yeah, outside. So 
If you um, are just starting, you'll have to wait till the snow is gone, but if you started garden preparations in the fall, it should be ready for you as far as um, mulch and amendments and things like that. But the first thing I always recommend is to put up a good fence because if you go outside and you just put your lettuce in the ground somewhere hoping that someday we'll put a fence up, guess who's gonna find your lettuce? The deer. The, the deer. And then what's going to happen next year? They'll come back and all summer they'll come back and come back. They'll knock your fence down, they'll jump your fence because they know you have lettuce in there. But if you put your fence up first, they won't know there's anything behind the fence. They won't even care, right? <laughs> so do that first. <laughs> All right, and then begin working on your soil, whatever you're going to use, if you're using manures or if you're using kitchen compost. Um, in the fall, I like to dig a big trench down the center of the beds and even in the hoop house um, and bury my compost in that all winter and then just cover it up. Yep. What, what height of the fence do you need for the deer? So if you are in the woods and you're surrounded by trees, mm -hmm. not as tall because the deer can't run through the trees and Yeah, it's so kind of an open, more open. So if it's more open, man, go as tall as you can, at least eight feet. Mm -hmm. And in fact, to keep them from jumping that, I've heard some people will put a second uh, shorter fence outside of that, like two feet in front of it, mm -hmm. just a wire or a string or a ribbon, a bright plastic ribbon run around that because they can't jump both. They feel like they're going to get stuck. So, We've done that. We'll yeah. Like put, and it's just That's what literally a string mm -hmm. in front of a five foot fence. Mm -hmm. And so they feel like if they go over that string, they're going to get mm -hmm. stuck and Perfect. not be able to turn around. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You had a question? Don, we had a friend tell us last year that if you hang fabric, cloth, plastic, anything on your fence, they won't jump it because they can't see what's on the other side. That's good advice too. Yeah. And get a dog. Dogs keep them away too if you have an outside yeah, yeah. dog. Dogs Garvey eat green beans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Garlic to keep the deer away, you mean? Yes. Okay. Put, put it all along the edge of the fence and grow a bed about this Okay. You have a That's permanent good. garlic bed. So she's suggesting to grow garlic around the garden to keep the deer out. Okay, good. So um, when you're preparing your soil, another tip that I like to give if you're in a hurry to get things in the ground, like I usually am, is to put some black plastic down on top of it to warm it up and thaw it out. You can get lumber wrap for free at the hardware store, and that's usually what I use. Just cut it to, to match your beds and put that on sometime in April and it will melt the snow, the snow and it'll warm up the soil underneath and just get it ready for your plants. Don, what did you call that? Lumber wrap. Oh, right. Yeah. That's where you get it yeah. from? Check places like Home Depot back mm -hmm. in the lumber section. They'll usually have a shelf of it and you can just take it for free. Or you can buy black garden plastic and different things like that if you want to do that. And then if you don't have a garden space, Think of something else you can do. Trash cans, uh, shoe hangers <coughs> leaned up against a wall. If all you have is a little apartment, you know, landing, just figure out a way to start growing your own food, however that looks like. You can look online, there's so many ideas for uh, urban gardeners these days to grow. So you've got your plants and they're getting huge and now you need to get them ready to go outside. So you need to do something that's called hardening them off. That just means you're getting them ready to put them outside. You're acclimating them to the cold temperatures, okay? You can't take a, a beautiful little plant that you've had sitting in your nicely protected bedroom window for four months and throw it in your garden and expect it to survive. Okay, you have to what's called harden it off. So take your plants out onto a front porch in the park shade, park sun, for a couple of hours one day, bring them in, take them out the next day, two or three more hours, bring them in the next day, add a little more sunshine, you know, back and forth a few times like that, and then eventually put them in the full sunshine, because if you, if you put them right away in direct sun, it will scorch their leaves and they will go into shock. Mm -hmm. And if there's animals brushing up against them or too much wind or whatever rustling them around, um, they're going to be in shock. So that's why you just do a little bit at a time. And then eventually leave them out all night, okay? Um, after danger of frost, obviously, if it's tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. So the picture on the right is the hoop house. And by the way, I say hoop house, greenhouse interchangeably. My same thing, it's a hoop house. 
Um, that's how I'm hardening off plants now. So those are all my tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. And what I do is I put them up there usually sometime in April. And then I will take these covers, and you'll see them, the picture there piled up there. And I use bamboo sticks. And I just cover it, double row cover it, usually double cover it for the first week. And I will leave them up there like that, so that's how they're hardening off that way. And then I will take the cover off and let them harden off that way for a week. Um, and that's how I harden them off now. And what's the cover you use? Um, this one, I'm going to go over that, in, I think, in a minute here. But it's AG19. Okay. All right, so that's how you harden them off. Once you harden them off, then you can put them in the ground. So if you're going to put them in a, in a hoop house, you can do this a lot earlier. You don't put tomatoes and peppers and eggplant out until after frost, until you're sure there's absolutely no frost that's going to be left. So I don't know when that is for you. Um, but when you're going to transplant, make sure that you dig a really deep hole. Obviously, you're going to need a deep hole if you're putting a pot in there, you know, plant out of a pot this size. Um, and put something down in the bottom, some type of compost, or that's black worm castings, I'll go over that too, or um, tomato fertilizer, you know, put something in there to get it, give it a boost and get it going right away. The picture on the right is in a hoop house and they're just, I string them up, I do that right away as soon as I put them in the ground. And if you're going to put them into the garden outside without any kind of protection, Make sure that you do it on a cool day or in the evening or better yet on a rainy day. Because again, you're trying to avoid plant shock as much as possible. If you go out on a nice hot sunny day and you take your plant and put it in the ground, it will go into shock and it may not make it, okay? Um, the ones there on the right, they made it, but you know, I probably should have waited and done them later in the day, but I wanted to show you kind of what they can look like and those are cabbage. But again, look how big the cabbage are before I even put them outside. Um, and then make sure you water them. As soon as you put them in the ground, water them really well. And if you're going to stake them up, whatever kind of plant it is, if it needs staking, you need to do it now. You need to do it as soon as you put the plant in the ground because if you add the stake later, you're going to tear up the roots of the plant. Mm -hmm. And these are different types of support. The one on the top left is that bird netting that you can put over fruit trees. So I just zip tied that to the inside of the hoop house and the peas climb up that. In fact, you can do peas right now. I've started peas in my window um, and then I put them in the greenhouse and they love it in there. Um, I already went over the stakes and the, on the bottom or on the right hand side, that's a cattle panel that you could, that I put up between the posts in the greenhouse. And so you can tie plants to that. That's just another idea. If you're going to use the strings, like on the bottom picture, I've done that a couple of different ways. I've taken tent stakes and put the tent stakes in the ground with the plant and then tied a string to that up to the beam. And then I've also run a wire across the, the soil in the hoop house and tied strings to that. So there's different ways that you can do it. If you have just a little tiny space left in your greenhouse or your grow box or in your garden and you want to use every space available. This is called intensive planting. And so what you would do is take that little tiny space and take the whole package, if you want to, of lettuce or whatever it is and plant it all in that one space. And they'll all come up, like you see there on the left, a huge amount of plants. And then what you do, once you can get outside and move transplant outside into, from your hoop house outside, thin them out. Just take your fork again or your digging spade or whatever and take a big old bunch of those and break every single plant apart. You're not going to hurt them, okay? Break them apart and put them all throughout your garden wherever you want them. Maybe you want them in between your cabbage or in between your broccoli or wherever. You just move them around now wherever you want. And you've got all those plants now that you grew in that tiny little space instead of trying to do, you know, like one <coughs> little plant per pack or something like that. It's just another usage of space. And then make sure you spread them out how they need to be. Okay, so now that they're growing in the garden, I always want to mention pollination because it seems like at least out where we are that there's not as many bees as what there used to be. So you just have to kind of keep an eye on that. If there's no bees, how do you pollinate? 
So tomatoes are easy. You just walk through and just shake the, the vine a little bit like this. You walk through and shake the string or whatever like that. You know, it's really simple. Or if you have a fan blowing, the fan will pollinate them for you. Eggplant pollinates itself. And so I just leave it covered all summer long because it likes it really warm. Um, and then cucumbers, there's three different types. And I never realized if you want to grow a cucumber that doesn't need pollinating, um, get the parthenocarpic cucumber. No pollination required. And you can look those up and I have a Johnny's catalog out there on the table if he sells them. Melons and summer and winter squash, you can hand pollinate. So um, there's two types of flowers on the squashes. There's the male flower and there's the female flower. The female flower is the one that the fruit will grow from. So you leave those on the plant, okay? The male flower you take off and you literally just pollinate the female flower with it. I can't go into too much detail. People ask me that, but I just can't do that. So you can go online and you can watch it being done because it's just, anyway. There's a male and a female flower and you just pollinate them by hand. Just leave it on the, on the female flower. Just leave it there, it'll be fine. So that's how you pollinate the squash. So now what I'm going to teach you is how to extend our very, very short growing season. <laughs> this is one idea and it worked really well. I actually dug up my pepper plants from the greenhouse in October when I knew that it was gonna, they were gonna die out there because it was getting mm. so cold in there. And I brought them in again, put them in my sunny window. And they actually ripened. They went from the green to the red and the orange. And they lasted through December, through Christmas, and then they got aphids on them and I, then I just threw them away. But I thought that was kind of neat. I mean, it actually worked. Mm -hmm. So that's an idea for you. Um, this is the best thing that I would suggest doing. So you have a couple of options. You can get these. These are called PEX tubing, and they come in these four foot lengths like John, this. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Question. Yeah, you're, uh, when you brought the peppers in, did you have to repot them? I did. Okay, so if you put them in a pot from your garden. I did. Them, okay. I just dug them up with a shovel and I put them in a big flower pot. Okay. Yep, that's all I did. All right. And I think they got aphids on them because um, there's not airflow upstairs, you know, and aphids like it when the plant is a little bit stressed, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not getting the same kind of treatment that it was. Yeah. If you spray them with water and Dr. Bonner's soap, it helps. Yeah, you can spray them. I just didn't want to. I was tired of messing with them. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just say, okay, enough is enough. I've eaten all the peppers off of you. I don't need to keep you around anymore. <laughs> all right, so this is the PEX tubing. And what I do with this, I use it at the beginning and the end of the season. So I literally just stick this in the ground over top of my plants that I want to protect. So let's go through this scenario here. So technically you shouldn't be planting anything outside till after frost, right? That's in June. So what I do is I go out in May or the, at the end of April and I put my black plastic down. I start heating up the soil and thawing out all the ice, okay? And then I put these in beginning of May. I put these in and then I will put my probably cabbage, broccoli, and probably some greens in the ground and then I will cover, as you see, I will use these covers here to cover the plants and now this, this is a frost blanket, okay, and now I've added 30 days onto the beginning of the growing season. So now I just added all of the month of May because this is a frost blanket. Mm -hmm. So what this is, is this is AG19 frost protection, and it is 0 0.55 ounces. Now there are different kinds of these. There's one that's a 0 0.45 ounce, um, but that's for insects only. So you want the heavier, thicker one for frost. So then what I'll do is I will uncover the plants after danger of frost in June, especially if they're flowering, okay? Where did you get that? Oh, you can get these online. I think it doesn't have to be ag fabric. It doesn't have to be this particular brand. Um, you can order it through different seed catalogs too. They have it, but I've heard it's cheaper on Amazon. But I'll leave this up here. If anybody wants, you can look at it, take a picture of that. So then, You've just added 30 days to the beginning of your season, okay? 
Now, at the end of the season, I'll do the same thing. I'll put these back in the ground again. I'll throw my covers back over again. And now you just added 30 days to the end of your season. So now you've got May, June, July, August, and September just by using the frost blankets. And they're not expensive, and they last. Where do you get them? For years. Online. Online? Mm -hmm. Just look on eBay or Amazon. Just call it a frost blanket. No, 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 the hoops. I mean the... Oh, the hoops. I'm sorry. Um, any hardware store, probably Home Depot, Lowe's. It's called PEX, P-E-X. Uh, they use it for plumbing. Plumbing. For your water lines in your house. You can just buy it by a big roll and go. cut it to length. You can buy it by the roll. Perfect. All right. This is another idea that I saw online that I thought was kind of cool because anybody can do this if you just have a back porch. You literally just buy a bag of potting mix, cut the top of the, like lay it flat, lay your potting mix flat <coughs> on your deck and just cut a square out of the top of it, put your seeds in there, and cover it with a plastic bin. And you've got yourself a greenhouse. <laughs> I thought that was a really neat idea. Um, you can build grow boxes if you want to, or use windows, you can go down to the ReStore, you know, you can make it as fancy as you want to, or keep it, keep it as simple as you want to. Uh, this was built by my nine-year-old son for Mother's Day, so this is not fancy. But I always like to tell people that I got the most cucumbers out of that that I've ever gotten before in my life. <laughs> and I think it's because it was built with love. <laughs> but that's a pallet on the front that he just literally cut in half. And then the hoops are just the, um, oh, drawing a blank. What are those great hoops called? PVC pipes? No, it's not PVC. Conduit, thank you. The gray conduit hoops. Just stuck them in the ground. All right, so let's go over some other crops here. How many of you knew you could grow sweet potatoes up here in the north? I was told people? I couldn't. We were going to try. <laughs> yeah. I, worried. I have been told I couldn't do all sorts of things. <laughs> So what I used to grow them in a jar of water and they would rot all the time. So what you do, that's the trick, in the top left corner, you leave half the potato sticking up out of the dirt. Okay? You just buy a sweet potato or a yam. I've tried organic and non. Both of them will sprout or not sprout, depending on the year, depending how who sprayed it or what. So I would suggest trying both. Two or three of each kind. Um, and leave half the potato exposed and water it, and it'll start growing greens on the top of it. Okay, green plants. And that's the slip. Those are called the sweet potato slips. Yeah. You can order them from the gardening catalogs. They're mm -hmm. really expensive. And I know some people won't even ship them to Idaho. So if you're going to do this, you need to start it in November or December. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so I thought of this idea. You can do it now, and you can actually take the slip and plant it in a pretty hanging pot and put it in your window and eat the vines that come off of it because they're edible. Mm -hmm. And they taste like spinach. <laughs> You're looking at me like, really? You can. I'm not kidding you. You can eat them. So you can get it started now if you want to. So when the slip gets to be between six and eight inches tall on the potato, you snap it off. Okay, you don't dig it out with the knife and destroy the potato. You literally just snap it off the potato and you put it in a jar of water and then it grows roots on it. After it grows the roots, then you put it in the ground. Sweet potatoes grow up and down this way, so your soil needs to be light and airy and fluffy, like lots of perlite, vermiculite in it, uh, sawdust, things like that. Um, and then the vines will go crazy if you put them in your greenhouse. They will vine everywhere, so just keep them cut off. But if you want them to vine, they will grow new sweet potatoes wherever the vine touches the ground. So you'll have a potato here, you could have a potato over here, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But chickens love them too, so I just cut them off and throw them out. Mm. And then uh, kind of a rule of thumb is after they flower, about two weeks later you can harvest them. Mm. They take about five months to grow, by the way. Mm. So if you start them in May, June, July, August, and September, you should have some. And I will tell you this, this will be my third or fourth year growing them, I can't remember, but the first year I did them, I had sweet potatoes about that, about 12 inches long, and they're about as skinny as a pencil. <laughs> I know, 
you were getting excited, like, wow, she knows how to grow sweet potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> the second year, they were about six inches long, and they were a little bit bigger, so I'm getting better at it. Because I didn't realize that the soil had to be so light and fluffy and all of that. But, you know, you learn every year. Hmm. All right, so garlic. If you're not growing garlic yet, you need to grow garlic. So start it or put it in the ground. Take those big bulbs of garlic and divide the cloves up and put each clove in its own little hole in October before the ground freezes. Mulch the ground over about three or four inches with compost or, or uh, straw or something like that and keep it watered. You have to water it at least for 30 days after you plant it because that's when it does its most growing, okay? Um, is right there in the fall. And then how do you know when to harvest it? Well, once the bottom set of leaves die and turn brown and yellow and start falling off, you can pull it out of the ground. Usually it's end of July, early August. And then you lay them out in the sun or part sun and you dry them out. You can cut the stems off of them then. Um, and what I usually do then is I immediately pick out the biggest cloves that I wanna plant next year and I set them aside. So that way you're continuously, you know, keeping up your stock, rebuilding your stock every year. Because we don't know, right? We don't know if we're going to be able to go to the garlic lady. There is one somewhere around here to buy garlic. Um, I've heard it, the organic garlic at Costco that it grows really well. Somebody told me that. I haven't tried it, but that's just word of mouth. Bargain Giant. Hmm? Bargain Giant. Bargain Giant has it? Has um, and they're locally grown. Okay. Good. Um, I just include this as just for your information, so because most people don't understand how long it takes to grow a fruit or a vegetable. This is six months. This is from January to August. From the time I sowed the seed to the time I was actually able to eat an eggplant, that's how long it took. So that we don't take our food for granted. Amen. Grow Amen. asparagus if you're not growing it yet. I've heard it has a 20-year uh, lifespan in a bed. Make sure you put it in a bed that you don't mind it spreading. You're not going to be moving it. So put it in a place where it can stay there forever. <laughs> Once it produces the fronds like that and then they die, I just cut them off and leave it on the bed just as a mulch to help protect it over the uh, winter. And then I'll add manure or something to it. And I always get a huge crop in the spring. All right, so carrots. I used to grow carrots outside and they don't do very well. And then at the end of the season, I had to dig them all up and figure out, figure out how to keep them um, all winter long. Whether you're putting in them in a garage or a basement or a cellar or whatever, it seems like they would rot. And I just, nothing was working for me. So I had this thought, why don't I just plant them in the greenhouse? Well, where can I put them? So what I've done is I will start, on the picture on the left, I will start with one row, and by the way, that's toilet paper with worm castings on it that I put the seeds in, and I do that so I can see where the seeds are going. Mm -hmm. I dig a tiny little trench with an indention in it, and that's how I do it. Otherwise, the carrot seeds go everywhere. So what I do is I will do a row of carrot seeds probably in the next two or three weeks. I'll do a row, and then I'll come in. This is my tomato bed, by the way. I'll come in two feet or so, do another row in two weeks. Two or three weeks later, I'll do another row. Two or three weeks later, I'll do another row. That's succession planting. And then in between those rows is where I put my tomatoes in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carrots and tomatoes are companion plants. They love each other. Mm -hmm. And so I have discovered, too, that by doing this, I have carrots now year-round that I don't have to store because they're being stored in the, in the earth. Um, I've heard, you know, some people like to just leave them in their garden and go dig them up as they need them. When you have this much snow outside, I'm not sure if you really want to dig through that much snow to get a couple carrots, right? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> so more than likely to go to the store and buy them. So anyway, this is nice just to be able to go in there and pull them out as you need them. And they're not in the way because they're so thin, they just a little teeny tiny little row, they don't take up hardly any space at all. So that's an idea for the uh, <coughs> carrots. Now, winter squash I, and summer squash, but this is mostly winter squash here. I finally figured out how to grow them and get them to grow big, okay? So you have to put the black plastic down like I was talking about, warm up the soil first, 
In fact, with these, I leave the black plastic down year-round, even in the winter, it's just always there. I put little staples in the ground, it just stays there. Mm. Um, it's on a southern exposure, exposure hill, and um, I cut a hole where each plant is going to go, and then in the fall, after I pull the plants out, I put garden compost, kitchen compost, whatever I have, down in that hole where the squash is going to go, so that all winter long, you know, it's breaking down and it's getting ready for your plant. Um, and the soil's warming up with the black plastic. Then I'll take one of my pots here, probably in April, and I will sow the squash seeds in a bigger pot because they don't like to be transplanted. No. They do not like their roots messed with at all. Now, you can direct sow. That means you can take the squash seeds and you can put them directly into your mound of dirt if you want to. I've done that and I never get any squash. By the time the, the let's say, September uh, frost is coming around, you might have a squash felt that big. That's right. Be and sometimes your seeds don't germinate, and you're left with a squash hill with nothing in it. And that is so frustrating. <laughs> so I will sow them in a bigger pot, at least a four-inch pot, about a month before, they're, before it's, they're okay to put out, okay? And then what I do is I get the hole ready, and I will very gently, I cradle the, the, the plant, okay, in my hand, and I will just very gently tap it and dump it out onto my hand, and very gently I will put it down into the hole. And then I will cover it. Again, here's my row cover. And I will leave that covered until the squash starts to flower. Usually mid to late June or so, it'll start flowering. And then you need the pollination, and it's warm enough, so then you take the covers off. And by the way, you can water straight through these covers, okay? They're water permeable, so that makes it nice. And then, around mid-August, go around to all of your squash plants and pick off any kind of little squashes that you have that aren't amounting to much of anything. Because that's taking energy from the rest of the plant, and it's, you know, your bigger squashes that need to get really huge can't because it's so busy focused on this little tiny little thing over here it's not going to produce enough to make it worth it get rid of those little ones and then at the end of august because you don't need pollination anymore cover it back up again okay so now you've just given your squash plants another 30 days all through september for them to mature and get bigger and then once you harvest them put them in a sunny place let the skins get hard until you can't pierce it with your thumbnail anymore like I did on the porch there. And then you've got them for the rest of the winter. So that's how I finally figured out how to do winter squashes. <coughs> with green beans, there are two different kinds. There are pole beans and there are bush beans. If you're going to do pole beans, make sure that you have huge, tall supports, six, seven feet tall, or a fence that you can grow them on. Um, bush beans don't get taller than maybe a foot or two, depending on the varieties. Um, so just keep that in mind between the different kind of beans. Um, and how many of you have taken green bean seeds, put them in the ground, and half of them don't come up, and you've got half a row empty with no green beans? Isn't yeah. that the most frustrating thing? Yes. Okay, so here's what I do. I take a flat full of dirt, and I plant my green bean seeds in here, probably in May, because these can't go out till after frost, and it doesn't take them long to pop up. So I put them in here in the greenhouse and I just keep watering them. And then when they're about six inches tall, I put them in the ground about every six inches. And then I know I've got a plant. I've got a green bean plant every six inches. People have told me, oh, you can't transplant green beans. You can't do that. You have to put them directly in the ground. I've been doing that for years and it works fine for me. I don't, I don't know. So that's a suggestion with the green beans. And plant extra because they don't always come up. Um, a good brand is Provider. I don't know if you've heard of Provider, but that's a good green bean that does really well around here and grows lots of bean pods. Good for canning and freezing. All right, more crops to consider. Strawberries, obviously, you got to put a little bit of more money into some of these, but they're worth it because they come back every single year. And this is important because we just don't know if we're going to be able to get this stuff later. So if you know somebody that has strawberry baby plants or trying to get rid of, take advantage and put them in the ground now. They'll come back every year. Raspberry bush.
bushes take time. Get them in now. Blueberries can take seven years before you get a blueberry. That's right. Get them in now. <laughs> Carrots, we already talked about. Beets and turnips, same thing. They keep well in a cold garage. Um, cabbage, I've had last for a year. You can actually pull the entire cabbage out of the ground by the roots and hang it by the roots that way in a garage or in a cold room and you'll have cabbage all year. Um, potatoes, as long as you can store them properly in a cool place. Should What's your note them. about worms on the cabbage? Oh, yes. So, does anybody deal with cabbage worms? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I think I have tried everything that YouTube has offered. <laughs> so the best thing is just to cover them. So get the AG, oh, I can't remember the number, but the, it's 0 0.45. It's insect barrier. It's not frost. It's an insect barrier. It's a lot thinner. So that is the best way to keep the cabbage moths and worms off your plants. I would suggest that you cover them with these um, hoops right away as soon as you put the plant in the ground, even if it's a baby plant. Cover it with this, cover it with the insect barrier, and make sure there are no holes. Because <laughs> they will find their way through these teeny tiny little holes and they'll lay, lay worms all over your plants. And the next day you'll have holes in your entire cabbage. So you could actually take this fabric and cover it with soil on either side of your row and that, you know, and then use clips, laundry line, clothes pins, they work really well. Um, potatoes, so you can get organic potatoes and you can slice them, make sure that they have at least two eyes on each side, but you can slice them in half, cure them for a week or so before you put them in the ground and they will grow if you can't get seed, potato seed anywhere else, okay, you can do that. Um, corn. If you're going to do corn, make sure you do the shortest day possible corn that you can find. They have like 60 or 65 day corn now, which is nice. I don't think they get as tall, and I don't think the ears get as big, but it's corn, okay? And again, they say it can't be done, but yeah, I've done can. it. I've done it. Hey, good, I can vouch, sure, you can <laughs> vouch for me. <laughs> Grow them in flats, again, yep. transplant it. Put them outside when they're about six inches tall, yep. the corn. Um, and then Jerusalem artichokes are also called sun chokes if you haven't heard of those, but they spread like crazy. So make sure you put them in a place where you don't care. They kind of can take over your garden. And you can, leave them, you can leave them in the ground forever. They just multiply. And whenever you want one, just go out and dig them. They're kind of like a cross between a potato and a, a parsnip. I don't know, but they're weird shaped. <laughs> it's hard to describe them. They're delicious. But they're beautiful. They have these big, beautiful sunflowers on the top. That's what I was just going to say. I grew them in Arizona, and the flowers on get as big as a sunflower. I know. They're beautiful, and nobody would know that there's food growing under the ground right there. So it's, it's an investment. You can get them through the catalogs, too. Sunchokes is the other name for those. And you can, you can hang tomatoes at the end of the season, you, and you can have um, tomatoes ripening on it. That's right. You can take so the tomato January, plants February. out of the ground and hang them by the roots and continue ripening the tomatoes. That's right. Um, so there is a wonderful book out on the resource table on seed saving if you want to look up a particular plant, but I would suggest you start learning how to save your own seeds. Um, a lot of them are the same as far as just letting it go to a flower and then the flower dries and then the seeds fall off and you can save them. Most of them are kind of like that. Not all, but uh, the tomatoes, you have to actually squeeze the tomato into a little cup and let it mold, scrape the mold off, and then you can save the seeds that way. So start learning how to collect seeds. Um, save one or two plants out of your garden, tie it up to a stake or something, and say, this is my seed plant right here. Just make sure you dry them out <coughs> properly after you save them and label what they are. All right, how many of you do worm bins? Anybody? Only one? <laughs> Okay, so I decided I wanted to start doing a worm bin because I was trying to figure out what do I do with all my kitchen trash all winter. So I looked into it and I dis uh, discovered that you need worms that are called composting worms or red wigglers. Okay, don't go outside and dig up earthworms. Not the same thing. That's where I got mine, but um, you can do, this is how 
I did mine. If you look online, there's worm towers you can buy. There's buckets you can stack. It, there's, there's just endless ideas. This was just the way I did mine. Two plastic bins stacked in t inside of each other with drainage holes in the top one so that the worm waste can go down. Um, that's called like a T. And if you're going to use it, you need to dilute it one to 10. So like one cup of the worm tea to 10 cups of water. And you can water your plants with that. This, this stuff here? Yes. It's called Uncle Jim's? Um, Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. That's where I got mine. But I it? heard online, somebody told me that there's a worm farm around this area. Does mm -hmm. anybody know? You know what yeah. it's called? They used to, I don't think stuff. they're closed. Oh, I don't think okay. they're in business anymore. Um, so I took the top bin and filled it up with a little bit of just dirt and you know what they like is like dead leaves and newspaper and stuff like that. And then I dug two, a hole for the kitchen trash and a hole for the worms. And the worms go over there and they find the kitchen trash. So about every three months you have to start over again because they've eaten everything in there. So approximately every three months, you're gonna have yourself a big bin of gold, black gold is what it's called. It's extremely expensive if you wanna go online and buy it. Um, but this is how I do it. I just dump it all out on a tarp and separate it into piles. And the worms don't like the light, so the worms will go down to the bottom of the pile and you just scoop off your castings. And you just keep doing that until there's only a pile of worms left. And then you start a whole new bin. So just put some more dirt or newspaper in there and some more kitchen trash. Now, it does not stink as long as you bury the trash. If you just lift up the lid and throw the trash on the top, it will stink. And you'll have flies. But as long as you bury it, there's no smell or anything like that. Okay, so that is the end of part one. And that's what the website looks like. If you go down to the very bottom, you'll see links to the notes and to watching this on YouTube.